Good morning. And on behalf of the President of the International Peace Institute, uh, Terry and Rod Larson, I want to extend all of you a very warm welcome. We are particularly pleased to be hosting this event this morning. We have a very distinguished uh, panel, um, and we are privileged to have the Deputy Secretary General with us. The subject that we will be covering, advancing cooperation between the African Union and the United Nations and that experience, and Chapter 8 is perhaps most appropriately timed, not only because of the discussions underway in the uh, UN uh, today, and um, which are ongoing. But before I invite uh, the distinguished panelists to speak, may I take the liberty of um, sharing with you something that I was telling the Deputy Secretary General uh, when I was with him and the other uh, panelists, that um, I've had the privilege of knowing him for many years, and um, in my four decades of uh, uh, being with the Indian Foreign Service, I've come across a lot of uh, very important people, and in the context of the work of the UN and the Charter, I cannot personally, with perhaps one exception, uh, think of anyone who has advocated the importance uh, uh, of the Charter as much as the DSG has done. Um, he has been a passionate advocate, and I was telling him that, um, you know, the Charter in so many respects is not only a visionary document, but uh, one which is perhaps it would be impossible to redraft if we were to undertake an exercise today for a variety of reasons, but that's not important. But one of the sections or parts of the Charter, a very important part, uh, which was very correctly anticipated in 1945 by those who were doing the drafting was Chapter 8 uh, and the importance of regional organizations. And I, uh, based on my experience in the Council, I can tell you uh, that under Chapter 8 and dealing with the Article 52, I cannot think of um, any regional organization which is more relevant and important from the sets of challenges the UN faces today than the African Union. And um, I think it's still work in progress. We have um, a very distinguished academic who has written on these uh, issues. We have the um, Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs of Sweden, and Sweden is a country which has uh, invested a lot in the uh, multilateral system, both in terms of human and uh, material resources. And we are also very pleased to have with us the um, African Union De uh, Commission's Deputy Chairperson. I extend all of you a very warm welcome, and I now invite uh, the Deputy Secretary General to uh, set the tone for today's discussion. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Chair, uh, dear Hardip, uh, dear friends. Uh, I'm really on a panel with great friends. Hardip and I served uh, together, of course, since I came as DSG, and he was a very illustrious and, and successful perm rep of India. Uh, Annika and I have worked in the, I've welcomed her as a young attaché in the foreign ministry many years ago. Uh, you, in your case, it must have been a serious case of child labor, of course. Uh, Peter Wallenstein and I were professors. Uh, I served under him, actually, in the Department of Peace Research in Uppsala. And uh, Erasmus and I are friends from several meetings in the African Union, chairing uh, many African Union UN uh, meetings. And it's great to be uh, really among friends. I see many friends in the group also. You mentioned the Charter, and I immediately thought of uh, a line from uh, <coughs> Doug Hammarskjöld, who is, of course, the mentor of most uh, Swedish uh, diplomats, but also many international civil servants, uh, where um, he says in one of his markings, a uh, book came out after his death, he said that the future is two things. The future is the horizon. The future is the vision. Uh, but he also said very pragmatically, the future is also the step you take tomorrow. But the good, what, what this says is sort of the future, the horizon, in other words, the charter, is that vision. Uh, is that horizon, and things become so much easier if you have set a vision which you can then 
follow a, a reach by taking practical steps. So uh, thank you for reminding of the importance of the Charter generally, Hardeep. Um, I said the moment I, I came to the United Nations and met a group only a couple of days after I had taken up this post, this DSG, I said I think there are two chapters of the UN Charter that are sorely and sadly underutilized. Uh, the first one is Chapter 6, uh, Pacific Settlement of Disputes, particularly Article 33 is recommended reading. Lots of methods that, in my view, are not used as much as they should. And the second uh, underutilized charter is, as Hardip uh, mentioned, uh, art, uh, chapter eight. Although there has been quite a development, at least since I started working with the United Nations in this area. And I'm, I'm glad that today is a day where you really mark the importance of regional cooperation. Uh, there was a uh, retreat with the uh, regional organizations over the weekend that, uh, that uh, I know you, Erastus, attended. Uh, I was unfortunately on travel. Um, there is the uh, thematic debate of the President General Assembly uh, today uh, taking place, uh, and uh, this seminar is, is another example of focusing on this subject. I think this uh, probably uh, demonstrates uh, one very important conclusion about working in international affairs these days, and that is the very simple conclusion that we simply cannot do it alone. There, there is no organization, whether it is the United Nations or a regional organization or a government, that can handle today's problems alone. We simply, in today's uh, globalized, complex world, have to find uh, solutions together. And uh, this is not only uh, us and regional organizations, it's actually other actors also, particularly when we look now, for instance, at the SDGs that we are to achieve. We need to mobilize all good forces to make sure that we can bring about the achievement of the goals. And generally, I would say also that I think we in bureaucracies, whether it is United Nations or governments, and I've served both, uh, need to get away from the uh, vertical silo uh, organization and thinking uh, and conceptualization, and rather see the importance of going horizontal. Uh, if you look at practically any situation today, you come to the stage where you need to have the expertise of the pillars, of the silos, of the vertical organization. We cannot let down on prof professionalism, of course. But when it comes to solving problems, we have to go horizontal. Just the very formula, no peace without development, no development without peace, none of the above without respect to human rights, shows that these areas are interconnected. But we do not, in my view, organize ourselves well enough to work horizontally. I think this is a way of thinking. When we talk about reform, I think this is probably the most important thing we could do in the United Nations and in organizations that we really realize that we have to go horizontal uh, and look for the competences uh, that affect the problem. We should simply put the problem in the center. A glass of water is not bad, by the way. And then ask ourselves, who can do something about it? And then find some type of uh, uh, division of labor in the end. <clears throat> now, I had a great experience of working with the African Union. And that was uh, when I was serving as special envoy for Darfur in 2007 and 8. My co-negotiator, uh, co-mediator, was uh, Salim Ahmed Salam, uh, a great African and, uh, and a great friend. And we worked extremely well together. I think during those one and a half years that we worked together, we were completely, uh, completely coordinated. I went with him to the African Union Security, Peace and Security Council and reported together with him. He gave the introduction and I supported him. And then he came with me to the Security Council and reported. And I spoke first and he supported me. Uh, that was, on the political front, uh, completely uh, coordinated. And I remember those days as uh, an extremely good example. Now, they, people tell me that when it came to the peacekeeping operations setting up uh, UNAMID, this was much more complicated. But the political and mediation work certainly was extremely well coordinated, and it worked well. We brought about the beginning of negotiations, in fact, in November 2007, although they didn't achieve what we, of course, wanted, as you understand. So that was a very important personal experience for me. Now, since my uh, go, working at the, this time at the UN, I've mostly worked with the African Union on two very complicated situations. I won't go into detail, but many of you know them, have been on, on the barricades of those two issues also. One was uh, Mali, uh, and the other one was Central African Republic. 
Uh, in Mali, we had a very soul-searching debate inside the UN to what degree we should become uh, more, if I may say so, muscular. Uh, and we needed a, a, a almost an enforcement cap capability. In this case, uh, there was the French troops playing that role, and their role was recognized also by the Security Council. Uh, we had the same need in the in the uh, DRC, the Democratic Republic. Sorry, I uh, I should mention also DRC, of course, uh, where we had the uh, as you remember the intervention brigade, where there was also a need for a more, if I may say so, muscular component. On uh, Central African Republic, uh, this was from the beginning an African Union operation, and uh, then the French came in with their Sangaris, and then in due time it, this turned into a, a, um, a, a UN operation, as you all know. Uh, here I think this was an example of um, uh, some lessons that we learned from, um, from Rwanda, namely that we should not leave, uh, and, and, but rather the contrary, that we should increase our presence. You may remember we were asking both African and, and European countries to come to Central African Republic rather than leave it, as was the case in Rwanda. And uh, even if uh, the developments were deeply tragic, uh, it could have been worse, I think, if we, had, if we had left at that stage. So that was one very important uh, experience also. The last point I'd like to make is that we are now faced with the with the peace operations review and the peace building review. I see the Brazilian ambassador who served very well in the peace building commission. And you know the challenges that we now see both in the peace operations and the peace building. Uh, peace operations re review is set up by the Secretary General. The peace building commission review is set up by member states. They will probably finalize their work around the same time, early June. And then we have important work to do once these reports come in, because we will set the stage for how we work with these operations, which will strongly affect both the United Nations and African Union and other regional organizations also. Uh, we will be faced with what, what is the environment in, in which we work today? Uh, to what degree do the so-called asymmetrical threats uh, change uh, our, our um, uh, dispositions, our decisions on peacekeeping? Uh, to what degree uh, should we uh, add stronger elements related to human rights, uh, protection of civilians, uh, and other aspects that have to do with the holistic picture that we need to pa paint in, in today's world? Uh, all these things will come up uh, during this, uh, this very important uh, study, uh, and I think we need to then to look into the nature of conflicts today. I think Peter Wallenstein will give you some data uh, in his introduction. Last year was a bad year, and uh, I think it was worse than many years that I can recall. And we need, in today's world where we feel so much uncertainty, I guess we all do, about the different elements, uh, to try to find a common narrative, a common analysis, rather, uh, so that we can be better prepared to uh, deal with these situations. I must tell you personally that as a former mediator and and conflict resolution, uh, uh, person involved in conflict resolution, I feel that my classical, the classical uh, tools are not as effective, are not as relevant as they were. We need to have much more depth in our analysis, reach out to new factors in the economic, social, and cultural arena, uh, and uh, look into deeper uh, reasons why conflicts develop the way they do today. And uh, if we don't, I think that we risk not having a strong United Nations in today's conflicts. And that's why this discussion today is so important, where we ask how important institutions like United Nations and AU and other regional organizations can cooperate and better achieve the results we all desire. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, uh, DSG. Uh, thank you for um, pointing to the two underutilized uh, sections and chapters of the Charter. Thank you also for setting the tone of the discussion. And now, may I invite um, someone who has looked at these issues from an academician's uh, point of view, um, Peter Wallenstein. I hope I've got the pronunciation uh, right. Yeah, That's fine. You have the floor, sir. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, and in this very distinguished group. Uh, and I'm very happy to be invited. As you know, I come from uh, Uppsala University, and what I will present to you is a study that is available here on regional organizations 
I should also say that I'm affiliated with the University of Notre Dame, uh, where you have a peace accords matrix, which is very important to look at in the implementation of peace agreements that are negotiated. Uh, I'm also associated with the Nordic Africa Institute, and you will find the report uh, as well over there on uh, the regional organizations in Africa, and of course this is the uh, central piece in our discussions here today. Uh, and I think we are talking about these issues at a very important moment. Uh, and there are several reviews, several reports being worked out in the UN system on regional organizations. Uh, there is also a regional uh, organization report on mediation. Uh, and I'm uh, privileged to be a member of the Academic Advisory Council to the Mediation Support Unit. We had a meeting in Pretoria about 10 days ago discussing many of the issues that we talk about today, but from the point of view of mediation. So I think the regional organizations are taking a new role and a new attention uh, in the international system. And I think it is timely. So this book, uh, which uh, I and my good friend, Ambassador Anders Björner, worked on for several years at a time when nobody seemed to be interested in chapter eight. Everybody would say chapter eight, you mean chapter seven? Uh, or six, uh, eight was seem to be unknown, and today I think it is very essential. What surprised us when doing this was that we could actually build a book project based on, on, on a Swedish resource base. Lots of Swedes that have been active in all kinds of operations around the world, uh, but seldom as Swedes, as uh, diplomats from Sweden, but rather representing international organizations and the UN, as well as academics. So the book is a continuous dialogue, you can say, between practitioners and academics. And what I will give you is probably a little more academic perspective. So let me start where uh, Mr. Eliasson just ended, more or less, namely the situation we are in in 2014. Uh, we will publish uh, data on this in about six weeks. So let me just give you a quick preview of 2014 in perspective. Uh, it is one of the years with most wars in the past 15 years. It is a year with more battle-related deaths that we have seen since the end of the Cold War. We calculate that last year about 100,000 people died in political battles involving uh, uh, use of weapons and uh, for political purposes. Half of those deaths are recorded in Syria. And Syria, I think, constitutes an important challenge. Uh, it is, of course, not in Africa, but it is an important challenge to all of us and affects all relationships uh, globally. And there is also the conflict in Ukraine, which, of course, should be the matter of regional organizations in Europe, and we can debate how well they are doing compared to others. There were also peace agreements negotiated last year. Uh, but by the end of the year, there seemed to be only one conflict that really seems to have ended through that, and that's the conflict in Mindanao in the Philippines. Most of the other peace agreements, ceasefire agreements, succumbed to the dynamics of conflicts. What is most striking for the past year is that quite a number of all these conflicts are what we call internationalized. That means they are not just fought in a territory of uh, one country, uh, or with only the government and rebels from that country involved, but a lot of international involvements. Involvements not only by faraway countries, but by neighbors. In many ways, they indicate that regions are failing in keeping the peace, as we have earlier talked about failed states. So I think in that sense, it is a very important challenge to the international community right now. And in a way, you can ask, has the international community lost control why are we not able to contain these conflicts as we have been able to do it for many years before? And that is a challenge, and that is a challenge to the United Nations, of course, but it also to the relevant regional organizations. And what we ask in this particular book, the sub-question, so to say, is are the regional organizations challengers to the UN? Are they going to replace the UN or not? And I will try to respond to that question as I go on. Now, these challenges, of course, not only include the issues of war and peace in the, f in the form of direct violence, but there are also other challenges that also have been mentioned, uh, uh, epidemics, 
uh, migration, uh, there is um, organized crime, there is the use of violence through social media. Uh, all these are important challenges when we look at the entire picture. I will restrict myself to the, those things I think I know the best, and that is conflicts. And that's where uh, we can see that the challenges to the regional organizations and the UN are strong. And as I mentioned, not only in Africa. Uh, a bulk of these conflicts are in Africa, but not all. Uh, and as I said, Syria is the most important, the most serious one, and I think it is a real challenge. And you can ask today, what is really the role of regional organizations in containing and dealing with that particular conflict? Uh, it's also a challenge in the sense that there are norms that we now no have adhered to in solving conflicts. And when Jan Eliasson says that some of the tools that we have taken for granted that are good in mediation, part of these are these norms. And these are norms about the unviolability of borders, uh, the integrity of states, uh, the protection of civilians, uh, and uh, similar norms, which have been very significant in dealing with conflicts. And we find today strong actors not adhering to these things, but rather preferring to change borders, occupy territories, move uh, the border markers, or even destroy them. So in that sense, this is a very tough situation that we are facing. Uh, what can we then do about this? Well, looking at these experiences that we record in this book, which re refer to Africa, to uh, um, um, Europe and, and to the Middle East. Uh, I think it is important to try to develop how to organize the relationships, how to organize the relationships between the UN and regional organizations. Uh, and uh, looking at, in particular, the situations between the United Nations and the African Union, I think this is an important relationship. Uh, and, and the experiences that we can uh, portray here suggests that there is a continuous, so to say, reliance on ad hoc measures, inventing new solutions, finding hybrid, hybrid relationships. Uh, and I think that's good enough. That's what you do in a crisis situation. But if you are going to develop a, a relationship that is more lasting, you need also to have a framework to work in. Uh, I think it is important to think about the possibility of creating such a framework between the UN and various regional organizations, and, and in particular, I would say, the African Union. Uh, when we look at the situations of mediation, the use of sanctions, uh, peacekeeping operations, uh, other kind of peace operations, as well as peace building, it seems often to be that there are these kind of hybrid arrangements rather than uh, a, a lasting and, and well-worked-out relationship from the very beginning. So that's what I would plead for, that we should discuss working out such relationships between the organizations and perhaps also on the secretariat level, and where one also would face the issues of funding for these particular uh, operations. Uh, so the conclusion uh, and this, so to say, the response to the question that we posed, are these all, uh, organizations challenges to the UN? Well, on the whole, I would say they are complementary rather than challenging. Uh, but I think they constitute at least a, a significant input to the UN system and actually means that also the UN has to get its acts together and uh, in that sense meet what these regional organizations are otherwise going to do. So it's not a challenger, but it is definitely something pointing to important issues that needs to be discussed, and I'm looking forward to further discussions here today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Um, your message that at the heart of this um, um, lies the manner in which you organize the relationships between the United Nations and the uh, regional organizations. Um, but today's discussion is on the African Union and the experience between the uh, United Nations and the African Union. And we are very privileged um, to have with us His Excellency Mr. Erastus Maencha, the African Union Commission's Deputy Chairperson. And I would like to invite him to outline the perspective as he sees it from Addis Ababa. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, moderator of our session this morning. May I, at the outset, first of all, thank the co-conveners uh, of this important session, uh, and that is uh, the permanent mission of Sweden to the United Nations, uh, the International Peace Institute, uh, that with us have co-organized this event this morning. But I'm also happy that uh, I have on my left my good friend, Deputy Secretary General Eliasson, that uh, we have worked together on many issues, and more so because he and I, we have also been co-chairing a very important tool of the UN, and that is uh, regional coordination mechanisms, uh, which in a way also addresses some of the issues that we are talking about here this morning. I want, first of all, to agree with what uh, Deputy Secretary General said this morning regarding the framers of the UN Charter in 1945-42-45 for having had that vision of envisaging that there would be regional mechanisms. Because if you think back to 1945-42, the African Union didn't exist, and the European Union didn't exist, and many regional organizations. Uh, and, and having put that in that document. But, but more so, I think what is important is for us to be able to read the three chapters very carefully, chapter six, chapter seven, and eight, but also see the aspect, the developmental aspect that is there. And I, saw, I say so because we have, as Africa Union, the deepest reputation of hosting over 60, 70% of UN peacekeeping missions. And we ask ourselves, why? And perhaps some of the answer can be found if we read these three chapters and interpret them in the broader context uh, in which the framers had envisaged it. But uh, having said that, I, I think the Deputy Secretary General has also raised a very important point this morning, and that is uh, you know, having this session here that gives us an opportunity to be able to say some of the things that we can say, we cannot say in the confines of the UN and, 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 and also the African Union, because let's be candid and say them here in this context and agree that what he developed as a lack of effective horizontal mechanisms, that we are sometimes part of the problem and therefore should be part of the solution. Because for many of you, like I, who have been in many of these meetings, you hear and you listen to same discussions, same issues, year in, year out, and perhaps there is a danger that either we are working in sometimes in silos of what is just said in a way, but also prescribing the same things. And therefore we should be asking ourselves, can we be more innovative? Can we be active on the ground? Can we see action? Because there are some issues which we've been talking to each other for a long time, but we don't see change on the ground. And that's why it's so crucial that this morning as we talk here, we'll be going for a general debate uh, on this same issue. And, and we hope that this debate, you know, it, given the environment that has been described here, uh, you know, the, 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 we are dealing with a totally different issue in a way and evolving situation that this debate here will go a step further and that we can start to see uh, some uh, you know, changes that will help us to be more effective with each other and also see some really changes on the ground uh, in some of the situations that we now face. Um, I think it's, it's clear that when we are looking at this issue, I think there are three, four areas that are crucial from the African Union perspective. First of all, I think let's look at the architecture and, and, and refine some of those missing links in it. Uh, the second point is the financing. 
which we think is so crucial, and and call it not necessarily also financing, but also having good tools, including mandating, but also good interpretation of the three chapters, but also equipping um, peace support operations on the ground. And I think the third one is the interactions among the actors, but also looking at the environment under which we are working. And that's why I agree with the earlier one when he talks about the classical tools cannot continue to be prescribed, so we need to have a candid look at them and see how we can change them. He did, in a way, also refer to how even organizations like ourselves can work better. I, mean, I see it. And here, let me talk about the AU because I know it. Because we happen to have what we call uh, Architecture for Peace Support, the Af APSA, African Peace Support you know, Architecture. But we also have the Architecture for uh, governance. And often at time you find that the two architectures, really you don't define very clear interactions between the two. And there is always a danger that you could be either stepping on each other's stone and unnecessarily, but also lack of that synergy. And I think I was also happy to see, particularly in the retreat that we have just had, that there is strong effort now and, 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 and move first of all, to see that uh, uh, the special political missions, uh, particularly to Africa, and, and also peacekeeping operations, there is now that move to, to see that synergy between the two of them. And I think this is also part of us reading the entire chapter. What we would also like now to add here is the ongoing processes of development that we can see the link. Because when we look at what happens on the ground, particularly, uh, recurrence, resilience, sustainability, is because this third element, particularly development, doesn't come often as quickly as what we have seen, for instance, in the case of uh, uh, Sudan, South Sudan. We all celebrated, here's independence, we were raised champion and left and, and we left a very fragile uh, you know, environment. And that's why we have also seen weaknesses and the recurrence of that. I think the point that uh, Eliasson has raised, particularly the experience we have gained working together in uh, uh, Central Africa, in uh, Mali, in uh, the Great Lakes, in Sudan, are highly instructive. And, and I want to add here an anecdote, particularly on Libya. And this is, I'm coming to, particularly the aspect of mandating. Now, if you look at the other cases I mentioned except Libya, because we work together, we can see a lot of synergy, although we haven't really been able to come out and, and, and you know, close those missions. And, and, and the need to continue to have close dialogue be, between the African Peace uh, uh, in the Council and also the UN Security Council. And, and I think this is extremely important, particularly in the architecture that I mentioned, that there is need to see this close collaboration between the two. And as we work on the ground, volatile situations where there's no danger particularly to civilians, to peacekeepers, that we interpret chapter seven in a more robust way that we can safeguard life and also the peacekeepers. But now talking about, say, Libya, quite frankly, we haven't had really eye-to-eye -eye discussions on this issue. And you can see it's chaotic. And I think we need to ask ourselves, how do we then, even when we are working together, 
help each other. Because I think there is a danger, and I, I liked what you said when you said uh, classical tools, because you yeah. know, one size fit all approach could be sometimes a, you know, a, a kind of approach. And, and, and if we are able to, to see that each crisis requires special tools and special approach, I think that will help. And I think that's all that we bring to the table and we hope to continue to dialogue on this issue. Now, the second point I thought I would talk about is financing and the other tools that I talked about. I say so because sometimes uh, uh, my job, like yours sometimes, is, 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 is having sometimes to go to the field and look at, you know, uh, uh, our forces on the ground who are not, who are ill-equipped, but also who are frustrated. Uh, but not only that, but also the troop contributing countries because of uncertainty. I know this is not an area that we have resolved. We are talking to each other, saying, what do we do? Do we, you know, make it more certain by, uh, you know, referring to assessed contributions? Or do we continue to rely on uh, this, uh, uh, you know, uh, special funds? Uh, I think it's so difficult. And, and here, I like to thank particularly the innovation that is emerging. For us, it would have been a nightmare if we didn't have this triangular approach now, where we work with the UN and, uh, and the European Union, who have addressed this aspect in a way uh, of, of, of resourcing. But I, I think let's bring it where it belongs, because after all, if you look at the regional mechanisms, we are doing the work of the UN Security Council, we are just simply agents. So why are we not able to address this issue and put it on the table? Now, I think the last point that I want to bring here this morning is some of the tools that we have also employed on the ground, uh, and which I think we should continue to look at. Uh, we have had two models, for instance, in the case of uh, MISCA or AFISMA, that is Mali, and uh, sometimes we use these uh, abbreviations, which can be very confusing, and also Central Africa. Uh, we have had a situation where Africa Union moves in when actually there's no peace to keep. Because we move in, it's a very dangerous situation, first of all, to create an environment for the UN to come and keep peace. And, and, and at that point, Rehard the missions and make them UN. I think that model we need to examine to see what is missing. The other model is the hybrid, like what we did also in the case of uh, DAFO, um, and, and see lessons learned from it. Uh, for us, I think, as I speak here this morning, we have, as Africa Union, developed a common position on the whole paraphernalia because our architecture, the African peace and support operations, has two elements, very important and integrated. First of all, it is preventive, but also reactive. And, and here, I should have also said something earlier when I was talking about financing, that let's invest more in the area of prevention. Unfortunately, prevention doesn't catch airlines, uh, headlines, and even the work that is done, even by us on the ground, is, is not easy for anybody to give credit to and understand because sometimes it's done in the twilight of, of the hours. But reactive is, we invest a lot, but we all know that prevention is better than cure. So we are suggesting let's invest here more. But having said that then, I think let's look at this model so that we can see that synergy because even for us, the story doesn't end with the African Union. We have very effective sub-regional tools mechanism, the ECOWAS, the ECAS, the Southern African Development Community, which we also need to work. And I think it goes back to the architecture that I talked about, that we need to look at the entire architecture so that there is synergy, there is proper dialogue, there is proper mandating, there is proper resourcing. And I think that is 
safeguard guarantee and also development a proper exit strategy that will ensure sustainability that will ensure resilience of what we are talking about this morning i thank you well thank you very much sir i think uh, the unmistakable message which uh, resonates from your uh, uh, presentation is that when the african union um, and the united nations work uh, and are on the same page uh, you get uh, better cooperation on the ground. And you mentioned Libya. Uh, I was on the Security Council uh, when resolutions 1970 and 1973 were negotiated, and I know a little bit about what went wrong there. And uh, the consequences um, are still unfolding uh, uh, um, as a result of uh, the two entities not being on the same page. And you also make some very powerful points on um, uh, financing on how the regional organizations have uh, are in effect doing the work of the uh, UN um, uh, on the ground and it should stand to reason that uh, since you assume the burden and the responsibility for doing that the requisite uh, kind of cooperation and support should be forthcoming uh, from the um, uh, uh, parent or the larger larger body uh, you also say something which uh, you know I have been saying for long, that um, peacekeeping in the UN, at least in terms of the classical paradigm, is um, an agreement and then for there to be a peace to keep. But when um, uh, pressures are put uh, and uh, expectations are raised for um, uh, blue-helmeted uh, 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 personnel to be sent in uh, before there is a peace uh, agreement, uh, in effect, that ends up taking sides in an ongoing uh, internal conflict. Now, that is as much a problem for the regional organization as it, in fact, is for the United Nations. And I think the overall credibility of the functioning of the system uh, will need to be um, uh, preserved by ensuring uh, that uh, blue helmeted and uh, both regional and UN um, mandated forces are sent in uh, according to accepted norms. Now you can evolve those norms, but you can't uh, do away with them entirely. I'm sure everyone's looking forward, sir, to a very um, interesting discussion, but I have one more distinguished um, panelist, uh, Annika Söder, the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs of Sweden. Madam, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Puri, for sharing this, uh, sharing this event. And it's great to be here together with, with friends. Um, so many important things have been said. And why one would wonder why Sweden would take this on to discuss the, the AU's role together with the UN uh, or uh, to engage in the regional organization's uh, issue. Let me mention that. Uh, we do this uh, with a very strong um, engagement, re-engaging in the United Nations, re-engaging with uh, Africa, with Latin America, with Asia, with the new government that came in in uh, October uh, last year. Uh, I would say we do this as a modern version of uh, Olof Palme and others, whom actually Jan is old enough to have worked with. <laughs> um, and we do so uh, being a small country and feeling that we have the understanding of problems related to trust, respect, and uh, tolerance. Uh, and for me personally, this is also in the spirit of Doug Hammarskjöld. I had the pleasure to be the executive director of the Doug Hammarskjöld Foundation before joining the government again. Uh, and his spirit, caring for the weaker party, I think is extremely important in this uh, context. Uh, uh, then to uh, Mr. Muncha, uh, I think actually that you should be really proud of what has been achieved in the African Union when it comes to peace and security. If we look back 15 years ago, it was a completely different situation, both when it comes to the role that the AU takes on and the role that the Rex the sub-regional organizations uh, are playing. So I, I really believe the glass is half full. Having said this, there are many aspects in the AU-UN relationship that we should carefully look at. And one is, I think, as I said, trust and respect. And 
finding common ground. Uh, the other one, uh, and this is related both to hi Libya historically and Libya today, identify interests and purposes together. And this is, of course, the hard part when, we're, uh, when we are looking at that. Then, as has been said, it's about how the Security Council relates to the regional organizations. It's about transparency, consultations, uh, and maybe sometimes in opposite to being effective. So how can we create both legitimacy and efficiency uh, in the workings between AU as a regional organization and the Security Council? Uh, the other one is, of course, uh, finance and funding. And this has already been mentioned. And I think this is a challenge for, for the UN and for members of the UN to see to it how can, how can uh, operations be funded that are not fully UN blue helmet undertakings? And how do we um, almost philosophically look at the different roles, like uh, the very robust role that Amisom took on uh, in Somalia, uh, with the UN playing more of a traditional peacekeeping uh, role? And what did that mean uh, for impartiality? What did that mean for, for efficiency? Uh, another aspect that I find extremely important, and this is of course because the AU and the UN, we're a lot more than peace and security, we're development, uh, human rights and so on. And I th believe that lately there is the last, let's say, 15 years, 10 years, there is a feeling among many UN members that the UN is not taking development into account. Uh, sufficiently in dealing with peace situations. And I think this will become even more important, this dichotomy and solving it in the new situation of threats that have been mentioned by so many of, of the panelists uh, already, not least with non-state actors and the reasons behind their actions. And this takes me to inclusivity because that is an important feature both for the EU, uh, the UN, and sub-regional organizations' actions on the ground. If you do not involve ordinary people, if we do not see to it that there is an ownership of the processes that we engage in, they will obviously not last. Uh, and I mentioned then the role of women. Um, Sweden has proclaimed itself to have a feminist government. This means that rights, uh, resources, and representation will play a key role in how we conduct all our policies, domestically and, and internationally. And this is, of course, about rights, but it's also about making use of all the human resources that you have in a peace process, uh, for example. Uh, I had the privilege to, to experience the inclusivity issue when I worked in the Dark Hammarskjöld uh, Foundation, together with the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center in Accra, where we started a work on sub-regional organizations, the AU, the UN, and non-state actors, meaning civil society. And I believe that work that is still ongoing will also make a contribution to how we view uh, the joint actions between the, the UN and, and the uh, AU. Um, then, of course, there is this question, why did this uh, group of Swedes write a book about the Arab League, uh, the OSCE, the African Union, and, and so on? And I think this is another sign of this tradition that we have of uh, engaging uh, for uh, the better of as many as as possible. Maybe the perspective that is lacking is this inclusivity perspective, since this is a, a volume written by academics and, and diplomats. But I could certainly uh, recommend it. And I understand there are free copies uh, in, in, the, in the room. Um, so let me just finalize by mentioning what you're all aware of, the processes of change that are ongoing. Uh, the review of the peace operations, uh, the review of the 1325 on women, peace and security, and the UN peacebuilding architecture. 
uh, and there are other important processes like the post-2015 agenda, of course, that also influence how we work together and where the regional organizations can play a role in uh, monitoring and following up on the universal goals that may be decided in, in September. Uh, when it comes to all these change processes, we are true believers in the role of regional organizations. Uh, and uh, my colleague, Olof Skog, our PR here, chairing the organizational committee uh, of the Peacebuilding Commission, uh, will try to do his best, with the backing of the government, of course, to see to it that the sub-regional and regional perspectives are being looked at as the review of the Peacebuilding Commission takes place. And I certainly look forward to soon go to Addis Ababa again, hopefully to present this uh, volume and also to discuss how uh, Sweden, the European Union, uh, uh, how we can continue our work together to, to the benefit both of the UN and the AU and the people uh, affected. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, this leaves us with a clear uh, half an hour to um, address questions to this distinguished panel. Um, may I request that the um, it indeed be a question and not a comment or a long statement, because then we have more effective use of time. And please indicate whether you are addressing your question to a particular member. Some questions, of course, will be the kind that uh, all four may wish to um, um, uh, address. So the floor is open. Yes, the gentleman at the uh, rear, yes. Good morning, um, Kai Stabel, um, coming from the Consortium for Conversational Conflict Resolution. It's it's a, it's a brilliant, brilliant to hear the desire for this change and the, to talk about collaboration as something innovative in the 21st century is, is great. But what I want to do is take it a bit from the macro level and ask the panel, how do you think we can replicate what was done in advance of <clears throat> and uh, the, the Second World War and other great wars, which is a more fierce change of management. You saw 600 senior officers, et cetera, being relieved of service before the US went into the war in 1940-41. And the reason I'm pointing to this is, if you look at the resident coordinators that we send into the field, the special representatives that are sent into the field, very few of them are picked back mm -hmm. if they do not perform. Very few of them are able to no, very few is an unfair statement. Many of them are able to, to have a collaborative spirit with other agencies, including the AU, et cetera. But, but how, how can we have a more effective system that holds these, these persons yeah, accountable? Thank, thank you very much. What you're saying is that uh, you need more effective uh, uh, representation on the ground. And if I read you correctly, you're also advocating wholesale sacking. But I think if that is the question, the panel will come back to it. Uh, yes, sir. The latter, OK. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm Massimo Zomazoli from International Idea. Professor Wallace referred to the uh, multiple challenges, conflict, war, migration, human trafficking, uh, the role of uh, transnational organized crime, especially in areas that are not actually under the control of states. And we are talking here really of addressing complexity also in these uh, very uh, volatile situations. You referred even to the um, concept of fragile, fragility in, in, in the regional perspective. So how would you think the UN could uh, play a role considering the weakness of states in addressing these in their territorial areas? Well, thank you very much. I read the question as how do you address issues of fragility, especially when they're coming from non-state uh, uh, sources. Yeah. Yes, next, please. Please, yes. Thank you. My name is Werner Bounds. I'm the UN Director in Brussels at the Foreign Ministry. Uh, thank you so much for organizing this on my first day in town. You want me to stand up that early in the morning? <laughs> uh, I know this is about uh, UN-African Union um, interaction, but I'd like to draw your attention to something that is a bit intriguing to us in Brussels, which is new forms of trilateral and even more parties cooperation, that is UN, African Union, but also African Union, European Union, African Union, NATO, NATO, European Union, NATO, UN, EU, UN, and there you have it all. Um, 
So very often we look at this as a question of um, cost efficiency, uh, who is best placed to do what, uh, non-duplication, avoid that things are being done twice by uh, uh, parallel or, or competent concurring organizations. Uh, do the things that actually need to be done is also the key question, I believe. And now we have different investment options. I believe we have uh, somewhat uh, underestimated the budget impact. Uh, I give you one example from the EU to the African Union between 2004 and 2014. There's been in all a 1.2 billion euro investment uh, in cooperation. Uh, so this is not to be underestimated. Now you can only spend that money once. Uh, it, it's it's uh, a, a false idea to believe that you can have double access to, uh, to these budgets. So um, that brings me to uh, actually my question I believe mostly addressed to Jan Eliasson. Uh, what, what is the role? How do you see the role of the UN in all of this? Would it be uh, giving supreme legitimacy? I believe that it is crystal clear. Is there a role of coordination? Uh, can the UN do the coordination between all those organizations? Is that something that it should do? Uh, in other words, uh, how to avoid uh, an institutional jungle uh, where the strongest party would uh, gradually eat up the, the weaker parties? Uh, is there a role for the UN in terms of sustainability? You send in a peace operation, be it UN or EU or African Union, whatever, but who's going to stay in the longer term and, for instance, do the peace building till the bitter end? That is my question. Thank you very much. Um, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Darinel Rodriguez from the Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict, uh, GPAC. Um, you mentioned that uh, or was uh, there was an agreement that uh, the current tools, the th current toolkit for conflict prevention, peace building, uh, perhaps need the inclusion of some more innovative uh, approaches, tools. Um, if you think about it, a lot of the tools that we have right now are more focused on state responses, while a lot of the threats actually transcend this state, uh, what states can do, and then you need to reach out to other actors. And my question uh, builds on uh, Ms. Soder's uh, remark on inclusiveness, and it's how, how, are, uh, how is the UN, how, are, how is the African Union working to promote this inclusiveness of civil society organizations, for example, working on peace building and, and to complement this multi-layer governance approach to security? Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. We have four questions. Um, we could perhaps take one more, and then I request the panel to uh, respond uh, to all five. Uh, yes, Anita, please. Thanks. This, this is about the charter. And actually, uh, regional organizations are um, mentioned in chapter six itself. The very first article of the charter um, says that even before the Council, Security Council, considers a situation, um, if, uh, before, prior to that, uh, among various actors, regional organizations could be addressing the issue. Uh, so the question is, where, what is the primacy here? Is it the Council? Is it the regional organizations? Um, so regional organizations are not just Chapter 8, but they are actually in Chapter 6 as well. Thank you very much. Uh, this is the inside wisdom of the Department of uh, Political Affairs. So I'm, I've always wondered, after 40 years, what is the sequence? I mean, I, sh I would have thought the sequence is you go first to a specific settlement of disputes. First, you try uh, mediation, then you try everything. If that fails, sequentially, you go to uh, the council and chapter 7. That is how it should be. But you're right. In practice, I don't know. But I leave that to the panel to uh, respond. Uh, would you like to start, Mr. Deputy Secretary General? We have five questions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, you're right. It's, uh, it's Article 33. And you're right. Article 33 contains the bridge to Chapter 8. Just to tell you the eight methods we should use before, uh, before, uh, <clears throat> before the, um, the um, I'll read out so that I won't complicate things. The parties to any dispute shall, first of all, seek a solution by negotiation, inquiry, mediation, conciliation, arbitration, judicial settlement, 
resort to regional agencies or arrangements or other peaceful means of their own choice. And then in Chapter 8, you find that, in fact, the intention of those who wrote this charter was that one would first try to solve it on a regional basis, and that, that wasn't possible. It was to go to the Security Council, but all the time in contact with the Security Council. So that was the whole idea. And that shows that we, we are building on very, we have a very strong foundation for this type of work. Uh, <clears throat> just a few uh, comments. Yes, we need to have the right type of leadership. Yes, we need to have flexibility. We think particularly of this now when we are looking at a situation where we apply the new program, Human Rights Up Front, that we have the right people in place. And we need to, to be uh, more uh, flexible and more, more uh, working less bureaucratically on that issue. Uh, the weakness of states, yes, this is the big challenge in my view that we have a situation in today's world where actually the nation state is challenged and when they, the state doesn't deliver to people what they would want and what they expect and where they, with the new information technology they have at their hands, then uh, you will have people looking for identities not in their nation state context, particularly if those borders were drawn up by colonial power some time ago in the Middle East or Africa, but you go to find your primordial identities, and these identities then are used uh, as uh, drivers of extremism. You go to the very proud traditions of your religion or your ethnic background or your tribe or your, your sect, whatever, where you have historic links. And then there are those who then by that identification in, in that very emotional quality, they use that to point out the others as the problem, demonizing. So the us and then syndrome stems from that. That's why it's so important that a nation state can be inclusive and that we have a sense of solidarity among different groups in a nation. Because the present trend, which is so dangerous, is to utilize these ethnic religious dimensions to heat up the temperature of the conflict. And that's why I said my classical traditional tools are not as effective, because we enter this very much more emotional element. And you see the form of violent extremism thriving in that, used by ruthless uh, leaders uh, on that side. I definitely think we should think in terms of uh, trilateral or other combinations. When we, for instance, now discuss migration, the horrible uh, problems stemming from uh, the flow of people across the Mediterranean, or by the way, also Central America into the uh, United States. You realize that you need to see this in a much more, in a wider context. I know there is a summit going, coming up between the uh, European Union and African Union, but I also think there is a need for involvement of uh, the Arab League and perhaps United Nations. You used yourself the, the phrase that uh, we, could, uh, we could give uh, impartiality uh, to the efforts, and of course we want to play that role. I still think that we should take a more modest view of the UN. UN can often play a leading role and should play a leading role when we have that mandate. But then very much in today's world, we need to think of being a, playing a catalytic role or being part of an action where, for instance, another regional organization can take the lead uh, while we provide that international uh, blessing of an, uh, of an operation. There is a problem uh, that today's world sees we see a world where the international organizations are becoming targets and part of the problem. In the past, the United Nations was automatically seen as impartial and neutral. Now we are targets in Mali. We are, the African Union is targets in Somalia. Uh, and uh, of course, it is unfortunately so that if you are part of a sub-regional organization, you can more easily become part of the conflict because you have national interests involved. So I think there is a need to see our complementary uh, values uh, and what we can uh, can add to by, by playing working together. But I think we should see ourselves as a possibility of an orchestra. Sometimes it's a big orchestra. Sometimes you have a chamber, chamber music. You know, a smaller orchestra. I think we should always adapt the organization to the needs. In summary, I would say after this very interesting discussion, I think we need to focus on three things. I think we need absolutely to focus on prevention. This is a cri de coeur, in fact, this discussion about that we are almost losing control. I think if we were to focus more on the preventive side, that's where, where our comparative advantages are, whether it's chapter six or chapter eight. Chapter seven, yes, that's when you, people, all, that's when the things already have exploded. I've, in this room, I've pointed out the life of a conflict. This is the life of a conflict. It's very long. 
But CNN and perhaps also the Security Council sometimes see the conflict only in the middle. We forget the pre side, we forget the post side. Pre and post, that's our comparative advantages. That's why we have the, all the preventive human rights up front, uh, seeing conflict early on, seeing a food crisis coming up six months later. Post is the institution building, development, uh, reconciliation processes. That's where we need to work focus. We are now right now stuck in this middle part where the fires are burning, as Peter was, was saying. So prevention, number one. Two, speed our reaction. We are too slow. We are too slow. I like the fact that you have set up this African Union uh, standby force uh, and are about to, to do that. We need to be quicker. Actually, we did peacekeeping much quicker in the 60s and 70s than we do today. Um, but that speed of reaction should be, uh, in the best of cases, on the preventive stage. And then lastly, we should use all the tools of the organization and regional organizations, not only the political ones, but also the economic, the human rights dimensions. Uh, and then I think on the very concrete side uh, uh, that we should work on, I um, guess the, we should work on three levels, two levels. The strategic level, I think we should get more and more presenting issues together with the UN Security Council and with the African Union Peace and Security Council in Addis. Sit together and present our issues together on the strategic level for the member states. Secondly, I think we should continue our very good work on the operational level, how we do the operations, not least the, how we translate the mandates from the Security Council uh, to the work. So continue this very good work. And Annika is absolutely right. We have made great progress. And then also, I think we should really watch out now for what the Peace Operations Review is doing and the Peace Building Review. And I'm glad, Olof Skog, you, are, you took over the chair for the uh, Peace Building Commission. And I'm sure that you will work uh, in the spirit of this meeting uh, in your continued work. So thank you for giving me the chance, because I have to leave in seven minutes, because I have a, another event. Well, th th thank you very much. May I request you, sir, to uh, respond to whichever of these five questions uh, that you think are the higher priority, yes. Well, I, I think I'm so much in agreement uh, with what has just been said that uh, I don't want to repeat everything in the interest of time. But let me begin by thanking Anika also for what she said, that in the last 10 years, actually the last 15, 12, 13 years, we have seen great progress. But Africa Union cannot claim that alone without the support of international community. And, and all we are saying now is, how can we work better? Because we are really reading from the same page. The question is how to refine these tools. And, and that, I think that is the essence of the questions that have come around. It's very clear, in fact, I'm happy when you read from chapter six that the bottom-up approach is what we advocate. And, and that is underlined in, in, the, in the chapter itself. So let's, let's, in, let's practice it, the bottom-up approach. The, the second one, um, the refining of, 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 uh, of the tools, particularly the consultative process, is extremely important. Uh, first of all, to be able to, to understand the triggers for each conflict, because they will be different. And, and we are then able to, to agree on the intervention and, and, and exit strategy. In fact, somebody was saying the other day when we were in the retreat, there are some missions that have been going on for as long as the UN has also existed because there was no clear exit strategy. That means you never developed benchmarks, you never developed you know, standards that would enable you then to be able to agree. And we do have some, even in the continent, where people are asking, how do we exit this kind of uh, a situation? And I think the, the third point, uh, you know, that was raised by, by the EU, uh, uh, you, you brought in this, the jungle aspect that, you know, really uh, predatory environment. And I think this is what we are talking about, consultative process, because if you do it, uh, especially at the bottom up, you are likely then to identify synergies, issues of leadership, issues of complementarity, and issues of, uh, of, of, of intervention. I think that is all that I would say at this stage. Thank you very much. Can I request my two colleagues to just take a minute each? Uh, and even if those two questions on wholesale sacking and uh, inclusiveness and civil society get left out, we can discuss those some other time. But would you like to take a minute though? Because we have to wind up.
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, just one minute, and that's uh, to uh, Mr. Massimo's uh, question uh, about fragility, which I think is a, a big problem. And the, the concept that I think is useful here is the conflict trap. Countries are trapped into conflicts, and they generate new conflicts, and they generate new development. And so you need to break out of those. Who can do it? Maybe the UN, but I would here say that's a big role for non-governmental organizations that can reach in in a different way. Perhaps the Secretariat can also operate in a more non-formal way than, say, the Security Council. So here is a, a clear case where one could find new ideas and perhaps learning a bit from how humanitarian organizations actually do have access in a number of these kind of situations. So here is a real important challenge that I think we should really focus a lot on. Thank you. Annika. Thank you very much. I think the questions related to uh, uh, the EU role in the AU and the non-state actor issue are actually related. If you look at the situation presently in Libya where the UN is uh, maybe working on, on a resolution where we have a perceived European Union interest of uh, either saving lives or preventing people from coming from Africa. We have interests from Africa related to the well-being of their citizens, and all of the three, uh, will, and we have non-state actors abusing a very fragile situation in, in uh, big parts of the region of North Africa and, and the Middle East, spreading into Africa. Uh, how can we find a way forward in dealing both with those uh, non-state actors that are really violent and that the Charter may not have foreseen and find ways to create this trust that we need between the different actors, the European Union and, and Africa, in dealing with this problem. Also, bearing in mind the earlier Libya experience, I think that's extremely important. But having said this, I, we should, of course, recognize the role that the EU plays together with the AU in this trilateral cooperation, not least in Somalia, where the EU is training uh, the AMISOM uh, peacekeepers and the UN is playing a role and uh, where we have uh, finally seen some very good results and we keep our fingers crossed for a good good uh, outcome of, of this um, undertaking. So I think we need to do some work on non-state actors and on how to solve uh, the, the border issues between regions uh, as well. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Before I request you all to give a, a warm expression of, uh, uh, through applause to these four distinguished panelists, I just want to say a few um, words um, in order to um, give you my sense of where we stand. But first of all, let me thank the um, UN um, uh, and through the DSG, the UN, um, and let me thank the uh, permanent mission of Sweden and through them the um, uh, government of uh, Sweden and then most of all, let me thank you, sir, and through you, the African Union, uh, for the discussion today. I think the subject that has been discussed is extremely important um, because much of the, uh, many of the challenges that the UN system faces today, uh, they have to be addressed through chapters six and eight. I think we have seen in the last few years a somewhat uncritical utilization of chapter seven particularly Articles 41 and 42, and we are still coming to terms with what those consequences are. So a sequential um, look uh, at uh, challenges through Chapter 6, and as the DSG reminds us, the bridge uh, uh, that is provided in Article 33 from 6 to 8 is most crucial. Um, many of the issues that the UN faces today, it is responding to admirably, and yet there are some challenges that the UN system perhaps was never intended to address. The issue of state fragility, the issue of relations uh, within states, social inclusion, participatory governance, issues related to uh, the new challenges, global pandemics, uh, issues like the non-state military actor, these could not have been anticipated by those who uh, drafted the charter. And I would just say that for this purpose, uh, in consultation with the Secretary General of the UN, the President of the International Peace Institute has set up an independent commission uh, uh, on multilateralism, which is looking at 16 issues uh, through a them thematic uh, bottoms-up approach, in which issues of fragility, in which issues of um, uh, inclusiveness, 
uh, uh, etc. will be covered. We are hoping also uh, for the ICM to go before long to Addis Ababa uh, in order to engage the African Union on those issues. But let me conclude with those remarks and request you to give our four panelists a very warm um, appreciation.